moving on into step five, where we're you know talking about actually recognizing the revenue at this point, um, the amounts that you've allocated to each performance obligation. That amount gets recognized as revenue when or as performance obligation is satisfied. And you satisfy performance obligation when or as control of the underlying distinct good or service gets transferred to the customer. Uh, and when has control transferred down the bottom? Well, it's been transferred when the customer has the ability to direct the use of the good or service and to receive substantial of the related remaining benefits. The key question in this determination is, are you satisfying your performance obligations over time or at a point in time? Now, for a performance obligation that's being satisfied over time, um, companies are going to have to identify a, a single method by which to measure um, performance <clears throat> excuse me, progress to completion. But before we get into that, the, these criteria here on the slide are there are three conditions that um, have to be satisfied, or any one of them have to be satisfied in order to be considered to um, be satisfying a performance obligation over time. First is that the customer simultaneously receives and consumes benefits as the entity performs. And the way um, some implementation guidance that the FASB put into their standards, one way to determine that is, could another entity step in and fulfill the remaining performance obligation without having to substantially re-perform work that's already performed by the entity? An example they give in the standard is freight services, where a company is moving goods from Vancouver to New York across the country, and they get it as far as Chicago. And some people providing input to the FASB said, well, there's no benefit that's been provided to the, the customer because the goods are not in New York yet. But the FASB said, no, for this particular analysis, um, benefit has been provided because the company is receiving benefit and consuming it as the um, service provider is providing the service and moving the goods partially across the country because the, um, the replacement of the secondary uh, freight industry and freight company would not have to move the goods back out to Vancouver in order to um, get them to New York. They just pick them up in Chicago and move them forward. The second condition, the second criteria to consider is, does the entity's performance create or enhance an asset that the customer controls as it's being created or enhanced? And then the third is that the entity's performance does not create an asset that has an alternative use to the entity and there's an enforceable right to payment performance completed to date. And that enforceable right to payment um, has to be something that, you know, is linked into costs incurred to date plus some reasonable margin. It doesn't have to be the entire margin on the project, but there's got to be um, costs incurred to date plus a reasonable margin. Now, I mentioned before, you know, if, if it's something that's being satisfied over time, you've got to identify a single method um, by which you're going to measure progress to completion. And the method has to be reasonable and reliable. And if you can't identify a reasonable and reliable method, then you recognize revenue um, to the extent of the costs incurred um, if you expect to re recover the costs. And you can only do that until you've identified a reasonable and reliable method. So you've got to essentially eventually come up with a reasonable and reliable method. And then the method has to be consistent with how um, control the underlying goods or services is being transferred to the customer. So just depending upon the circumstances, it might be appropriate to use an input method or an output method. So you, th you think about output methods like um, service performance or, you know, appraisals or, you know, milestones reached or things like that. They, they might be appropriate, but sometimes output methods are not going to be appropriate. Um, you know, for, for example, methods like uh, the units delivered or units produced, they're not going to be appropriate if there's significant work in progress or, or finished goods inventory that you haven't transferred to the customer yet at the, at the period end. Um, input methods, you know, people are probably familiar with that. Those are things like cost incurred, labor hours, things like that. And you don't get a free choice here. you, you got to pick the method that best depicts um, measuring progress towards completion. Um, so you, you can't just automatically recognize over the, the longest service period either, like, like you can today. Now, there is a practical alternative available here, although the right to invoice practical alternative. And what it essentially says is that 
if the entity has a right to get consideration from the customer in an amount that has a you know, direct correspondence with the value um, that's been provided to the customer to date, then you can recognize revenue in the amount by which you have the right, uh, you know, in which you have the right to invoice. Um, and if the example they give is a service contract where you bill a fixed amount for each hour of, of service provided. So if a performance obligation is not satisfied over time, then it's satisfied at a point in time. And in those cases, you recognize revenue when the customer gets or obtains control of the underlying good or service. And this slide lists out some of the indicators that control is transferred. So you got that the entity has a present right to payment for the distinct good or service. Or you've got one or more of legal title, physical possession, and significant risks and rewards of ownership that are transferred or passed to the customer. And then another indicator is that the customer has accepted distinct good or service.